Are you ready to get into Revelation chapter number four? All right, let's jump right in. Revelation chapter number four here tonight. As you're turning there to Revelation four, it's the last book in the Bible. And so if you've gone to the definitions, you've gone too far. Okay, go back to Revelation chapter number four. We've covered a lot in Revelation one. If you are just new to this on Wednesday nights or first time in a long time, uh, we covered Revelation one and we talked about how John was on an island of Patmos, and we talked about how Revelation interprets itself, and we, we talked about how the description of Jesus was about to show up. And, and then in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, we've, we've talked about the seven churches. How many have enjoyed the Revelation uh, 2 and 3 and the study of the seven churches? Come on, wave at me. It's been so awesome. So last week, I tried my best to get through all seven so we can launch out from Revelation 4, but tonight I'm going to piggyback on last week's and I'm going to finish and get to Revelation uh, chapter number 3, which is the last church called Laodicea, the lukewarm church. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So let me do some recap. As many of you are catching up, watching online, if you're watching online, let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to have your participation as well. So there are four common themes Uh, to the seven letters to the seven churches. And here are the four themes. The four themes are, you're going to see the description of Jesus taken from Revelation chapter 1. And you're going to see his description change to every church. Why? We said every church has a different diagnosis, so every church needs a different description of Jesus. And we, we made the reference that if we have a heart problem, we don't want to see a podiatrist. <laughs> we don't want to see a foot doctor. If we have a, a ankle issue, um, we don't necessarily need to see the heart doctor. And so every diagnosis needs a different description. And we see that in these, uh, these common themes to the letters of the churches. You're going to see the phrase, I know, the statement, he that overcomes, and you're going to see, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So this is not on the screen, but I want to reiterate what some scholars believe. Some scholars believe that these seven churches represent seven periods or church ages in time, which would mean that the last church, the seventh church, the church of Laodicea, we are in that period right now. So that would literally mean if we're following what some scholars and theologians believe, that we are living in the lukewarm age of the church. How many would know that we're not living in that at Gulf Coast? Come on, somebody. Remember, every church has a different diagnosis and a different description. So we've covered the six, and I want to cover the seven. I do want to give you something on the screen that I've not given you so far tonight. And uh, if you can put on the screen behind me the different uh, diagnosis of every church, it's the first one at Ephesus was the danger of diminishing love. Uh, The second church, Smyrna, represents the danger of fearing and suffering. Uh, The third one of Pergamos represents doctrinal compromise. And the fourth one uh, represents, of Thyatira, represents moral compromise. Remember we talked about the deeds of the Nicolaitans uh, turning into the doctrine of Balaam. And we talked about the progression of sin when left unaddressed. We talked about the danger of spiritual death in Sardis, the danger of failing to advance in Philadelphia. And now here tonight, we're going to talk about the danger of lukewarmness. I want everybody on the count of three to say danger and do your best preacher impression like this. Danger. Are you ready? On, on three, it's out danger. One, two, three. Danger. Y'all are pretty good. I like that. The danger of lukewarmness. It's found in the church of Laodicea. I'm going to jump right in. Here we go. Revelation chapter number three, verses 14 through 22. The danger of lukewarmness. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, and thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, verse 16, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you 
out of my mouth. How many have heard different preachers and sermons on lukewarmness and God spewing them out of his mouth? Because you say I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and know that you are that you are no not that you are a wretched person and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee of me to buy gold tried with fire, that you may be rich and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke. And I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold. Somebody say, behold. I stand at the door and knock. I've told you before, every time you say, behold in the word of God, that's a transitionary word that means whatever happened before is about to change thereafter. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When John recognized that, that was the greatest revelation on this people planet because he was saying what happened before is about to change now that Jesus showed up onto the scene. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door, and I will come to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me to him that overcomes will I grant to sit. Uh, with me in my throne, even as I have overcame, and I sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here we are at the church of Laodicea, the seventh church out of the seven. Uh, John writing, we have traveling about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia. One would arrive at the fortified city of Laodicea. Several major roads would converge on that city. It was a city of medicine, of production, of eye ointment, of wool distribution, of manufacturing, and banking. Uh, all of those brought fame to the city of Laodicea. The people of Laodicea felt like they needed nothing. Industry was at full bar there. Everything was good. They boasted of their riches, and yet they were spiritually poor. Some of the saddest people that I've met in my life are some of the richest people that I've met in my life. And that is the case at Laodicea. Although they were famous for their eye salve, they were spiritually blind. Although they were known for their fine wool, they were spiritually naked. This is the only place in Scripture where we see lukewarm being used. The expression is drawn, watch this, please don't miss the foundation or you'll miss it all. This expression of lukewarmness is drawn from the geography of the area that surrounded this city of Laodicea. In the district of the Hierapolis, there were hot mineral springs whose water would literally be transported to Laodicea through conduits. By the time it reached Laodicea, it traveled a great distance. The water that came through the conduits was no longer hot. In the same way, the cold water that was also piped in from Colossae and to it would be lukewarm by the time it reached Laodicea. So Laodicea was great in industry. Uh, they had a lot going on. ISAV they were known for, wool they were known for, but they couldn't see spiritually, and they didn't realize that they were spiritually naked. And here we have something happening in the natural to point to something that was happening in the spirit. The water that was coming into a place ended up being lukewarm. Satan will have us any way he can get us, but he prizes the lukewarm religionist far above the cold-hearted sinner. I'm going to say that one again because that's real good preaching. Satan wants to have us any way he can get us, but he really prizes the lukewarm religionist far above the cold-hearted sinner. He wants both, but he really puts a badge of honor on the one coming in on Sundays and then living like the world Monday through Saturday. Hello, somebody. Hot water heals, cold water refreshes, but lukewarm water is useless for either purpose. Three possible heart temperatures of every believer that I want to just pull out real quick. It's not on the screen, so you can write down these notes as I'm sure your pen and pad are burning up from the previous three weeks, so stay with me. Fire extinguishers are on standby. Three possible heart temperatures 
uh, found in the word of God for every believer, okay? Uh, Number one, the heart posture that we should all desire and aspire to have is a burning heart. A burning heart is found in Luke 24, 32, where Jesus is resurrected and he walks with those and they ask this question, did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us in the way? And then we have a cold heart found in Matthew 24 and 12. How many of you in your life have ever experienced someone who had a cold heart? They just say, man, that person is cold Blooded. I hope you're not looking at your spouse right now. Matthew 24 and 12, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then we have a lukewarm heart found in Revelation chapter 3. So all of us have a choice today. We are all faced with a demonic distraction and a divine assignment. Every day that you wake up, before your feet hit the floor, you have a demonic assignment on your life, and you have, a divi- you have a divine assignment on your life. So there is either a distraction demonically, or there is an assignment from heaven attached to you. And all of those are trying their best to get to your heart. The question that I have here tonight is, do you have a burning passion for Jesus in this place. I've not made a public spectacle of this. I, I don't want to embarrass him. He may be here tonight. I'm not sure. I can't see with these lights so bright. But, but, but I have told several of you on these Wednesday nights that, that my heart burns for the lost souls of Largo. And that includes several business owners in Largo. And that includes several eating establishments in Largo. And that includes several pizza places in the city of Largo, but the one pizza place that sticks out far above the rest head and shoulders in my view is Sardo's uh, Pizza right here on whatever street this is called, and, and yeah, Ulmerton, thank you, and I got distracted by pepperoni, I'm sorry, I just, and, and so anyway, so I have not advertised this, but, but the owner of Sardo's Pizza, Santo Sardo himself, along with his lovely wife, have started, they started coming on Easter Sunday, and they've been three weeks running in these altars on Sunday mornings. Can we give Jesus praise for that? Why am I telling you this? That is not to brag that I eat pizza more than anybody on this people planet. That is to say, what is the price of a soul? What does it cost to win a soul for the kingdom of God? What, 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 what do you do when you wake up in the morning and the enemy tries to send demonic distractions at you, your response should be, no, I am committed to winning souls for the kingdom of heaven. Because, Lord, give us souls lest we die. Give us favor to win people because it is not the well who need a physician. It is the sick who need a physician. I know your works. Verse number 15, if I can just start there. Verse number 15 of Revelation chapter 3, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish I worked, you were cold nor hot. Jesus had told the Pharisees and the scribes that the publicans and the harlots were more likely to inherit heaven than them. Matthew 21 and 31, those who do not believe, uh, those who believe do not need a physician, um, may die of some dreaded disease before they even discover that they have it, Matthew 21 and 31. God wants us on fire for him. Watch this. I did not say that he always wants us walking through fire. I said he wants your life on fire because you are consumed with a passion to win souls for the kingdom of heaven. My assignment tonight is just simply to confront the lukewarm heart and the cold heart and to encourage the heart that is on fire. My assignment here tonight is to leap out of the church of Laodicea and, and, and embed myself in the church of Gulf Coast and Largo and to reach out to believers here and watching online and to ask you this simple question that reverberates from the island of Patmos, is your heart on fire for the things of God? Is your life in alignment with what he burns for. Because if your heart is not on fire for the things that burn, then you better be careful because religion is always knocking on the door to convince you that it's okay just to get by in life as long as you keep coming to church. 
Is your heart on fire for him? How many churches, verse 16, so then thou art lukewarm, you are neither cold nor hot, so I will spew you out of my mouth. The question on the floor is how are the churches in the mouth of Jesus? Two ways. They're in his mouth because they spread his word, and they're in his mouth because he prays for them constantly. Let me ask you this question. How can you fail in life if Jesus is praying for you? You ought to wake up every day just the same way that you do, understanding that there's a divine assignment and a demonic distraction, and you need to remind the adversary that's after your life, that's, that's waging war on your life, and you need to say, you know what? I appreciate your attempt to, to come at me and to divert me off of the calling for my life, but my elder brother Jesus is praying for me right now. He is making intercession for me right now, and he wants me to live a holy life, a just life, a pure life, and I will be on fire for his assignment, not yours. Well, what if you woke up every day and told the enemy that? I think it'd be good. You should try it tomorrow morning. What a terrible thing in either of these ways to be expelled from the mouth of Jesus. How many uh, so far here tonight would say, you know what, pastor, I've really enjoyed these seven churches, but I'm really ready to get into Revelation chapter four. Come on. So for the sake of time, I'll come back to this uh, in a different study, but I just really want to get into Revelation 4 um, here tonight. And, and if you have questions, um, <clears throat> I can get to you, I can come back and, and talk about the difference in the garment of salvation and the robe of righteousness. Um, we, can, we can do that at a different time. But tonight, let's get into Revelation chapter number 4. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. After this, Revelation 4, verses 1 through 11. After this, John said, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. Let me explain something to you at the onset of this. The door is still open to heaven. The door is still open to heaven. There is still open doors and open windows. How are there open windows? Obedience. How are there open doors? The obedience of Jesus. And so there are still open doors into heaven. The first voice that I heard was like a trumpet, that's significant, talking to me. It said, come up higher, that's significant. I will show you things which much be, must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat on the throne was to look at like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne and a sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne there were four and twenty-four seats, twenty-four seats, and upon the seats were twenty-four elders, and they were sitting. They were clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Out of the throne proceeded lightning. Somebody shout lightnings. Somebody shout thunderings. Somebody shout voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne and the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto a crystal. And in the middle of the throne and round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast he explains, remember Revelation will interpret itself or the rest of the Bible will interpret Revelation. The first beast was like a lion. Somebody say lion. The second beast was like a calf. Say calf. The third beast was like a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So these four beasts, each of them had six wings they were full of eyes, and they did not rest day and night. And here's what they said. I can't believe I got to come to church on a Sunday morning every single week, 52 times a year. They expect me to come. And I can't believe that I got to give my hard-earned money called the tithe. All the church cares about is the money. And I can't believe that we got to have an altar call every Sunday here at Gulf Coast. And I can't, they didn't say that. Why? Because they weren't concerned with material things. They weren't concerned about opinions. They weren't concerned about anything. Why? Because they were focused on the one who sat on the throne. And so their response was, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, and if he was, he is, and if he is, he'll be to come. 
And then the beast gave glory and honor and thanks to them who sat on the throne that lives forever. And the four and twenty-four elders before him sat on the throne and worshipped him that lives forever and cast their crowns before the throne. And here's what they said. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were created. I want you to see what's happening in heaven right now. Right now there's a mighty chorus that sounds like Ben and Katie singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then, and then on the other side of that, there are elders who are casting their crowns before the throne, and they're just simply saying, you're worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And in the, all of the middle of that, we have one that is receiving the glory that is due his name. Are you ready to break Revelation 4 down tonight? All right, it's a good landing spot. I have th about 30 minutes or so, and so I get to take my time. Verse number one. Let's go through verse by verse on this because that's the best way to do this. If you're watching online still, uh, follow with me. Somebody shout, Revelation chapter 4 online. After this, I looked, and behold, there was a door open in heaven, and uh, the first voice that I heard was of a trumpet talking with me. It said, come up higher. I want to show you things that are going to be hereafter. On three, somebody shout Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. That was just so I could get a drink of water. I appreciate that. There was a door that signified the entrance of the way into heaven. I just want to make sure I'm in the right place tonight. We still believe at Gulf Coast that he is the only way and the only truth and the only life, right? We still believe that he is the door, right? All right. I just wanted to make, I just wanted to make sure I was in the right place. So the door signifies the way to, of, of revelation into heaven. So this door was open, as it still is today, and there was a voice that said, come up higher. Uh, last week, remember, we talked about the difference between um, pre, mid, and post-tribulation. And, and I told you, you can tribulate if you want to, I'm out of here on the first load, right? So we, we said, come up higher. Uh, we, or Jesus says, come up higher. So some theologians believe that this also refers to the rapture. Remember we said last week um, that after um, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the word ecclesia is no longer found after Revelation 4. So the church as it was is not mentioned after Revelation uh, chapter number 3. And so he says, come up higher because he is calling out from the world and a trumpet is sounding in the same picture. So this verse is a description of the rapture as some theologians believe, and I would agree with those theologians. Uh, and then we have the voice uh, as of a trumpet. Let me read two verses really quick. They have it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, you know this. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, there will be a last trump, for the trumpet is going to sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. Then we are which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord Forever. So the trumpet in Scripture is always referring to a calling away or a separation. Notice it is his voice that sounds like a trumpet. When God speaks, his words begin to separate light from darkness and heaven and earth and truth and lie. And there is also a door and a trumpet in the same verse, which is a picture of the rapture. Um, let me jump out of this really quick because I want to give you one little theme in Scripture that I think is really cool. And uh, I want to give you two patterns to pay attention to when it comes to the presence of God in Scripture. And uh, you don't have to turn there, but just write this down because it would be a fun study for you uh, when you go and, and you have your intimate encounter and your time with, with, with the Father. Um, go to, don't turn there, but Exodus 19, 
um, I want you to see in Exodus 19 how we have the same imagery as Revelation 4 as it relates to the presence of God. So a pattern can be found in Exodus 19 with Moses meeting with God and Revelation 4, John being called up into the throne room of heaven. Again, Scripture is going to interpret Scripture. Old Testament is going to kiss the New Testament, and there's intimacy there at the feet of, of the Father. So Exodus 19, 16 talks about lightnings and thunderings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. It talks about the voice of God as a trumpet exceedingly loud so that the people of the camp trembled, all right? So even back in Exodus 19, we have lightner, lightning, we have thunder, and we have clouds, and we have the voice of God as of a trumpet. Let me say it this way. If you don't like things being loud on the earth, you're going to hate heaven. Huh? Huh? Exodus 19 and 16, voice of a trumpet wax louder and louder. Can you imagine some folks in church going up to the throne saying, excuse me, uh, Father, can you turn the volume down to a level that we understand? It says that the voice was louder and louder. Exodus 19 and 20 says God came down the mountain and Moses went up the mountain. The same picture of Revelation 4 is found in Exodus chapter number 19. I just thought that was cool. If you thought that was cool, say amen. If you didn't, say oh well. Same pattern is found in Revelation 4. If you said oh well, go ahead. There's four doors out there. You can go through. And immediately I was in the spirit. I'm just kidding. And behold, the throne was set in heaven. And one, somebody shout one, sat on the throne. There is only one way to heaven. And when you get there, there's only one God sitting on the throne. There is not a sun God and a moon God and a grass God and a mountain God and a feelings God and a hope, I wish it could happen God, and a genie and a bottle God, and you got to rub them the right way God. No, it is Revelation 4, and there is one God sitting on the throne, and there is one way into heaven, and his name is Jesus, and by the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit on the earth, he's leading you to both of those situations. Are you in here? Say, "Uh uh-huh. This is the second time John mentioned that he's in the Spirit, telling me, If he says it more than once, then I had better be living in the spirit. Are y'all in the room today? There was one that sets on the throne, which means it starts and stops with him. Pastor, what do you think about the situation? I don't know. Let's see what he thinks about the situation. Pastor, I need advice on this. Hold on one second. God, what do you say about it? Because I could be messed up in my theology or my thinking, but God, you're true. You're established in heaven. What does your word say about this situation? One sat on the throne, so it starts and stops with him. The throne was established in heaven. It is not moving. Our God is not a, on a mobile throne. It is set. It is established in heaven, which means the work is complete. Hello, somebody. That means your healing is already complete in Jesus' name. That means if I need healing, that i got to seek the one who's on the throne that's established that's not moving for my healing in my life. So we are now in the throne room of heaven of Revelation 4, and now we're going to get into the details of that. Verse number 3, if you're still with me, say, I'm with you. He that sat on the throne looked like a jasper and a sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, And it looked like an emerald. The rainbow looked like an emerald. A jasper stone was the last stone on the breastplate worn by the high priest. It was a purple stone, and purple represented royalty. Sardin stone was the first stone on the high priest's breastplate, and that stone was red, representing the blood of of Jesus Christ. And so we have the purple stone being the last stone representing royalty. We have the uh, f- we have the first stone uh, representing red, the blood of Jesus Christ, the first and the last. And then there was a rainbow on the earth uh, around the throne, and it was a reminder of the covenant between God and man. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you take a, a trip 
on the highway and you're headed into St. Pete, you will see some rainbows. And those rainbows do not represent what's happening around the throne of God. They represent a certain community that is responsible for moral compromise in our culture. The LGBTQ, XYZ, LMNOP, alphabet people. That's who I'm talking about. And I'm not poking fun at them because I don't know all of the, the terms and the letters. But what I am saying is the LGBTQ, LMNOP, XQYZ people have made the symbol of a rainbow into a symbol of compromise when God said it is a symbol of covenant. And the culture, if you're not careful, will turn something that is supposed to be covenant into compromise. And so the church... His job is not to run and shy away from those communities that are misconstruing the imagery of heaven, but rather to represent the imagery of heaven in front of them, have conversations in love, and show them that one day they will see the true rainbow that represents the covenant around the throne of God. Are you with me in the house today? And so if our hearts are burning we cannot be afraid to have very hard conversations no matter what the community it is, whether they are atheists, whether they are agnostic, whether they are LGBTQ, no matter what frame of mind that they are in or spiritual condition, our job is to set ourselves on fire and then everyone else watch us burn. Hello, somebody. So we have a royal priest. We have the blood. We have the covenant all in the same picture. Verse 4, round about the throne there were 24 seats, and upon the seats were 24 elders. And upon the elders were clothed in raiment, and on their heads were, were crowns of gold. The 24 elders, uh, 12 representing the sons of Jacob, 12 the apostles of the Lamb, 12 Old Testament, 12 New Testament, 24 elders in total. The crowns was the victor crown. It was a symbol of triumph representing military service because whether we like it or not, once you accepted Jesus, you are enlisted in the army of God. And now watch this. This is the best army to be a part of. Why? Because we have to face it, but we don't have to fight it. God fights for us. That's beautiful. And so we are in the army of God. White robes are clothed around these elders, and they represent righteousness. There's a garment for salvation. There's a robe for righteousness. Again, I don't have time for that, but verse number five, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire burning around the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven lamps of fire burning is a picture of the menorah. It represents the seven, the seven characteristics of God, or the Holy Spirit as a whole. We see in Acts, the Spirit came down from heaven as a fire and sat on us, reiterating the reality that not only should our hearts within us burn, but our lives should burn for Jesus. Some would say that the entire throne, when you're looking, when John's perspective was seeing the throne, he saw the entire throne on fire. And it doesn't matter to me if that's true or not. I know that we serve a God who is a consuming fire because his word declares that to be true. Verses 6 through 8, the Bible says that before the throne there was a sea of glass likened to a crystal. In the middle of the throne and round about it there was four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first was like a lion, a calf, the face of a man, and a flying eagle. And these four beasts had each of them six wings, and they were full of eyes within, and they rested day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So those angels, you know, that we set out, and they're, and they're cute angels. You know, they, they really are. Uh, we set out for Christmas time, and you know, we put the lights up, and we set those angels next to Santa Claus, and it's really, it's cute, it's beautiful, and, and, and we make sure that our houses are decorated correctly, and it's just awesome, but those angels have nothing to do with the angels that I'm talking about right now. I'm not talking about little baby fat flying angels that you see on commercials. 
These angels have purpose. These angels have meaning. And these angels are about to show us something that is to come. Are you ready for the description of the angels? There's various types of angels in heaven. There are seraphim, there are cherub, and there are living creatures. The seraphim are the ones with six wings crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If I were to be an angel, and I don't believe that I turn into an angel, I think that's bad theology. But if I were to be an angel, I would want to be a seraphim because I would want to live my life every minute of every hour of every day saying one thing and one thing only, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Cherubs are the ones with the many as four faces and the living creatures uh, are there as well representing the various types of angels found in heaven. There are four beasts or living creatures explained and represented in the Bible. You've heard me say this three times now, and I've asked you to repeat that once, but let me say it a fourth time uh, to complete it. A lion, a calf, and the face of a man or an eagle are the four beasts or the living creatures found in Revelation chapter 4. So the lion, each of them represents something. And I have this on the screen. The lion represents strength. Somebody shout strength. Strength. The calf represents service. The face of a man represents wisdom. And the eagle represents vision. So stay with me. Please keep that on the screen. Because I want to show you this. The lion all throughout the Bible represents strength. Jesus is called the what? Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Bible says the enemy wanders and roams the earth as a roaring lion or tries to reveal himself as such to show himself as false strength, never able to fulfill that promise. So the lion represents strength. And then we have the calf that represents service. And then we have the face of a man that represents wisdom. And then the eagle represents vision. This document here is not a document that was written by Josh Couch with what my desires are. This vision is from the throne room of heaven in Revelation chapter number 4, signed off on by the elders in heaven and the elders here on the earth to testify to you that like an eagle, we are to fly above the misunderstanding, fly above the uncertainties, and see things coming that we could not see if we were at ground level. Does that make sense? The eagle is swift. He is cunning. He strikes at the right time in the right season, and he has vision. There are four areas that protect the throne of God. Let me say it this way. They also give the recipe for a successful church. I believe, Pastor, how do you quantify success? Are numbers a testimony of the success of the church? Well, I think you have to look at the ministry of Jesus. And if numbers testify to the success of Jesus, then by that, Jesus would have failed because he only had 12 and one of them turned his back and gave up and then the rest of them followed suit. So if we're going by numbers, then, then Jesus didn't, didn't make the cut. If we're going by gifts of the Spirit, if we're going by the flow of the Spirit, then sometimes we don't see that flow in our services. So was it a bad service or was it a good? Have you ever been around people at lunch? Be honest with me. And someone said, come up and they say, hey, how was your church today? Did you have a good service? And then we typically respond, oh, it was a wonderful service. It was great. What constitutes a great service? I'm asking these questions to challenge you to get out of what we think and get into his word and say, okay, God, what do you say happens when the saints meet together? Here's what I believe. I believe somebody should get saved every time we gather together. I believe somebody should get healed every time we gather together. I believe the word of God should be declared with boldness every time we come together. I believe that we should encourage one another. We should confess our faults 
one to another so that we, that we can be saved and healed. I believe that accountability should happen in the house of God. I believe that we should train up the young so that when they get older, they won't depart. I believe the presence of God should be the only focus, not a preference, nor a style, nor a delivery. I believe he is the only one. If Josh Couch doesn't show up, this place can be packed. Why? Because it's not about personality. It's about presence. Y'all hear me? But according to the word of God, the four things surrounding the throne of God, I believe are the four things that should give us a barometer for success in the church. And and all of the things that I just mentioned can be summarized in these four categories. Number one, the lion, I believe that the church should represent strength in the community. I believe that as the world is flailing and as people are running, I believe that the church should be a lighthouse and the name of God should be a strong tower in the city of Largo. And if every other church wants to compromise, I believe Gulf Coast Church can be the strength of this city in the name of Jesus. The second thing that should happen in church every single Sunday and every single Wednesday is service. We should have people coming in saying, how can I serve you? How can I prefer you before myself? How can I wash your feet symbolically and naturally? How can I cover you? How can I pray with you? How can I sit with the baby in the nursery? How can I give towards the building project? How can I selflessly give beyond myself? And that constitutes a successful service. Strength and service. The the, the next thing is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if we desire more wisdom in our church services, then we should come in with a healthy fear of God, which is a recognition of his greatness over our lives. Lastly, vision. Show me a church without vision, and I will show you a church that's not going anywhere. We must have vision. Vision should see above where we are. Vision should challenge us. Vision should equip us. Vision should cause us to get outside of ourselves and see the city of Largo and the desires and the needs and the wants and 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 allow us to go in with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So somebody shout strength, service, wisdom, vision. Do we have that at Gulf Coast? I'm serious. I'm serious. And if, and if there are areas where you think that we are deficient, that could be God speaking to you to fill that void. If you think that our elders board needs more wisdom, then maybe you need to ask the Lord to open up an opportunity for you to speak to our elders and to myself. And by the way, all these are hypothetical. None of this has happened at Gulf Coast, right? I don't want you guys to think that I have some group following me around, ostracizing me all the time. That's not happening here. This place is holy, and this place is full of unity and wisdom. But what I am telling you is if God is challenging you in one of these areas, it could be that you are the answer to the challenge that he's given to your heart. Strength, service, wisdom, and vision, all right? That was around the throne, and that should be represented here at Gulf Coast Church. Can I finish by 8 o'clock? Somebody say no. (laughs) Okay, I'm glad that you have confidence in me. These four beasts also represented, just write this down, I don't have time to cover, but the, the four beasts represented the tribes of Judah, Manasseh, Reuben, and Dan, Judah, Manasseh, Reuben, and Dan. Those four beasts represented those tribes. I could give that to you, but we don't have time tonight. I will circle back. I promise you on that. Uh, Ben and Katie, keep me accountable to that if you can, okay? And the Bible says in verse 9 and 10, I'm almost done. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne who lives forever, the 24 elders fell down before them that sat on the throne and worshiped him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. So I want you to see this. Pastors Ben and Katie get up here and they are and the team and they are leading you in worship. And it's amazing the job that they do. If you love them, let them know. Come on, real quick, how much you love them. They do a great job. But here, here's what their assignment is. Their assignment is to unify the room to prepare your heart for the planting of the word of God, to till up the ground, to make way for the word of God to be planted, to sustain you throughout your week, all right? So when they're up here, 
They're, they're singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And guess what? You are representing the 24 elders in the congregation, and your response is this. I want to fall down before the throne, and I'll say, oh, God, you are worthy. They're saying you're holy, and I'm recognizing that you are. But because of that, you are worthy to receive the glory and the honor, and I'm going to give you thanks. Even if I don't see it, I'm going to give you thanks in advance for it in Jesus' name. Watch this. The crown represents the accomplishments of those that made it. The crown represented those who finished the race. If I can say it this way, the elders casted their crowns or cast their accomplishments before the Lord. We are to recognize that we own nothing here on this earth. God has given us stewards of everything. I do not own my house. I do not own this church. I do not own my bank account. I do not own my vehicles. I own nothing. It can all be taken away from me in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. But here's what I do own. Responsibility for obedience to God's word in my life so when I stand before the throne of heaven, he can say, well done, good and faithful servant, not depart from me, I never knew you. One of those things are going to happen. We are to cast our accomplishments before the Lord because he's the one that gave us power to make it happen in the first place. Anything happening in heaven should be happening in the earth. If heaven is giving glory, if heaven is giving honor, if heaven is giving thanks, how many believe at Gulf Coast we should be doing the same on Sundays and Wednesdays? <clears throat> He's worthy, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power. I just defied every odd. It is 759. Thank you very much. <clears throat> God bless you. Everybody stand on your feet here tonight. In heaven, there is one who is receiving glory and honor and power. Let me ask you a question. One thing that always challenged me growing up, the great theologian, Pastor Dale Denham, who's here, maybe he can give you the answer to this because I certainly don't know. The writer says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Revelation says we are to give glory and honor and power to the God who sits on the throne. Here's my problem. How can I, that came out of a sin nature, whose desire, like Paul, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't do, I want to do. And I'm wrestling between the tension of both. How many would be real and say that's their testimony sometimes in their life? Everybody else? The Bible says, no, I'm not going to say that verse. That's going to offend somebody. But I have a problem understanding that me as a mere mortal can bless the God of the universe. Church, we bless him by stepping in to his assignment and calling for our lives. We bless him by doing all the things that he's called us to do. We bless him that when everything in you says to do the wrong thing and you end up doing the right thing and choosing God over adversary, we bless him. We bless him through obedience. And tonight, I'm going to ask for you with your obedience to bless God. And I'm going to ask you to stretch up your hand towards heaven no matter where you are right now, all the way across this room watching online. I'm just going to pray a prayer over you. We're going to get out of here. Pastor Ben's going to come and make some announcements. But, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we have studied your throne here tonight. We have danced around your throne, and we have observed the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. We have observed the elders casting their crowns before you. We see the imagery of heaven played out in this service here tonight. 
And Lord, we are just simply asking, Lord, that if the church should be defined by strength and by service and by wisdom and by vision, then God, I ask that you would give me strength. Let the weak say they are strong. I ask that every person who feels weak, if you faint in the day of adversity, the word of God declares that your strength is small. I ask for you to remind your people tonight that they are strong in the spirit of God. Lord, that they will overcome because they are more than overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I thank you that you have equipped and empowered them to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I thank you that because of that, wisdom will flow. Lord, there are two ways to experience wisdom. We can go through a trial and mess up and find out how to not do it, or we can listen to you the first time. Father, let these people be so obedient that they don't have to walk through something and mess up to get the wisdom from heaven. And I ask God that every person under my voice would find an opportunity to serve your church, serve your people, serve your body. And when they do, everyone doing their part will accomplish the body of Christ doing its part. And lastly, God, let us have the vision that belongs to you. God, show us something for our families, for our marriages, for our children that we can accomplish on our own. Put super on our natural and do something amazing at Gulf Coast. God, do something so big that we don't get the credit for it. Only you get the honor and the glory. Do something so major that it shakes the foundation of our city and it reverberates through our businesses and souls come at the rate that they never have before. We bless you and we praise you, not knowing how, but knowing through our obedience we'll try. In Jesus' name, the church shouts amen and amen. 